And we're live. Gonna wait a few minutes to see people pop up. Hello there. I see some people coming in. How are you guys doing this afternoon? We got 10 people. Hi, Angel. I will highly encourage you guys to uh, chat with me. That's when I know you guys are alive and well. Hey, Alex. I say uh, uh, Mexican Korean. That's, uh, that sounds very nice right now. Mariel is here. Thanks for joining. Hi, James, Brenda. Hi, guys. Um, wait a little bit, a little bit longer. Hi, Paul. Wait a little bit longer to get some more people in, and we can get the show started. This is our third live event on Sensory. Um, on sensory training, sensory analysis, we're going to be talking about primarily, primarily about uh, fermentation. Some of uh, some of the flavor compounds that I picked out that I would like to discuss with you. We will be doing a little bit of, the, uh, of a summary. Uh, we're going to talk about a few things that I want to highlight about sensory training, about the tool, about the things that I deem important when uh, when performing sensory training. Hi, Mike, and it's my pleasure uh, for doing this. And and um, yeah, this is going to be again theory. I've done in the past uh, a little bit of the practical side of uh, uh, of one type of sensory training, which which is to use spikes to learn how to detect certain things. And I think that training is very, 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 very important. Um, okay, so let's, uh, let's kick things off with, um, I'm going to go back and forth with the presentation, uh, so you guys can have a full, a full look at, uh, at the screen. So, as I said, we're going to be talking about fermentation, and uh, uh, what I would like to talk about the learning points, and if you guys have been watching uh, this series, this ongoing series, uh, I've mentioned those things before, but it's very important to highlight, especially because when you talk, <laughs> sensory, it's, it's related to humans, right? If I'm talking about the same topic over and over again, I'm going to learn how to talk about it better. So every time that I finish a session, I think about it. I, I think to myself, man, I should have I should have said something a little bit differently. I, I should. We get better with experience. Even when I do repeat myself over and over again, if you watched a, pre a previous, previous session I was talking about the same thing, but uh, a newer one, I'm always going to be iterating, I'm going to be adding, I'm going to be talking about it differently, and it's going to be making more sense to you guys. So when it comes to sensory, we are the instrument, right? We, we use sensory analysis as an important quality control tool. Very, very, very important. I would say it's one of the most important ones because at the end of the day, who, who the people are drinking beer. Humans are drinking beer, not a machine. Um, my ears as, as, as brewers, we, we tend to get very technical. And it's very important to also look at the human side of it, what it is that we're perceiving, right? 
continuous training, takes in procedures, and uh, uh, the difference, the language, flavor compounds and not flavors. I'm going to talk about the language again. Uh, before I will talk about the definition, the flavor is a combination of everything. And, and that, that ties to the language of it. We have several inputs of information. Consider, consider our senses as, as, as inputs, right? We have our vision, we have our, uh, uh, our tactile, we have our aroma, which is one of the most complex ones, uh, our taste, our taste bud, our, our, our hearing. And we only have one output of information. Well, it can be it, it can be considered more, but one solid, the biggest output that we have is our speech, our language, how we use. For those who are more sensitive to expressions, and we humans are very good at faces and at reading faces, at understanding faces, but uh, primarily language, what comes out of our mouth when we talk about it, that's our main output. Right. If I'm doing something that it, a, a face that it's bad and it's it's foul, or if I'm happy, you guys can pick up on. It. You guys, it, we are very sensitive at, at detecting, but we need sight for that. Uh, but consider our speech as our main output for everything that we intake. It's not fair when you think about it. It's not fair to have that many outputs and uh, inputs and have one big output, which is which is the speech with. We just talk about it. So how do we describe the combination of taste, aroma, tactile sensations in our sight into, into something that someone else will comprehend? You know, it, it's very important to establish the, 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 base, the base language, the base communication. So the we start with definition, classifying. We humans like to classify everything. I feel like uh, some uh, disorders... Uh, uh, that we have the OCD that people talk about to be organized, to be classified. We are obsessed with that. We tend to science is obsessed with with classifying, with 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 putting things in order. And if something's out of place, we find another definition for that place. It's out of place, and and that becomes very convoluted and complex. Uh, and sometimes just we just have to embrace the chaos, but systematically. Um, so, establishing the language, establishing a definition is very, very important, a way that we can communicate with other people. Uh, tactile sensations, uh, oh, talk about the, the, the taste first, right? The taste is the things that, that we taste. We tend to be very similar on how we taste things, tend to be very similar. The sweet, the salty, the bitter, sour, and umami, and then the more taste have been they're being added to our um, to our taste palette. The sweet it, it represents the raw taste of energy. Uh, whatever whatever energy we don't utilize is going to be stored as fat in our body. Salt salts they t they regulate a lot of the bodily fluids uh, within our body. Of course, bitter bitter represent the taste of bitter represent uh, poison. We taught by our, our ancestors. Not to like poison. Poison, uh, not to like bitter. Bitter equals poison in terms of survival. Sour is a funky one. Cider, sour can either harm us or help us when it comes to survival. We like sour, we crave sour to bring in things like vitamin C uh, that it's present on on uh, uh, on citrus fruits, for example. And I, I mentioned that in every single lecture so far. Umami, umami is the raw taste of proteins. Uh, we crave that too. It's the savory taste. It's it comes with it. You know, all those states it comes with things that represent something that it's meant to keep us alive and well. Tactile sensations are the things that we that we feel, and uh, um, they also represent stuff to us. A spicy hot, spicy hot is that capsaicin brings in the 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 heat from peppers, but it, that the heat is not physical heat, it's more how how your brain interprets that particular compound. Carbonation, it's also related to pain. 
uh, rather than a sensation. It's it's pain that we feel in the tongue, and uh, uh, since it's doing something physically in your tongue, I'm not sure if I mentioned that in the past uh, lectures, but uh, um, it has a very phys uh, a mechanical role in our tongue to lift lift up fats and, and, and kind of cleanse and scrub things out of our tongue and out of our mouth and wash it down. That's why we associate carbonation with freshness. And it's sparkling, it's carbonated, it's fresh. It does have that mechanical role and it helps us get rid of things that we 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 ate. Um and and that, that leaves that this mechanical this mechanical aspect or this mechanical parameter of of, of carbonation that it's present very heavily present in beer. Uh, it aids with a lot of pairing with a lot of things. Viscosity, they can affect, it can affect in how we taste beer, how how heavy it may seem on your palate or, or how heavy it sits on your tongue, how many things live it leaves behind on your tongue. But, and I, I I leave that uh, uh, like at the end, aroma and predispositions. A lot of the aromatics, they, they you have some sort of, of, of experience with a lot. You have to have an experience with something that you don't like. Therefore, the, pre the predisposition. But sometimes it's not because you're predisposed of something that you didn't like before. You can learn how to like it. Hence, the acquired taste, the acquired, uh, uh, the acquired palate. You need, uh, in order to be, in order to be a professional in this area, you have to leave a lot of those things behind. Okay. So I'll pause right here. I'll go back to, um, I'll go back to full screen. And yeah, Ted, yeah, I'll audio much better. Good. Good. I'm glad. I'm trying to fix this as, as best as I can. Is that making sense to you guys so far? Any questions and comments? I'm more than happy to, to answer along the way, but I can I can keep up with the presentation and see and see how we do. Okay. Now we'll talk a little bit about sensory evaluation. Um, We talk a little bit about uh, sensory evaluation and and the tool on itself, on its own, right? The sensory analyst is considered to be the instrument. Our individual experiences they they are gonna they're gonna play a big, 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 big part on how you perceive things. Picture, picture not knowing. And I, know, I always love to give this example because I uh, I know that a lot of you guys can can associate with it, and then, and that goes back to the language. What can I say to will? What can I say to you guys that it will establish that base, that standard language, so you guys can understand what I'm talking about? That's that's sensory sensory evaluation one on one. So the things they experienced in the past will play a huge role when it comes to knowing what it is that you're looking for. So that's why sometimes when on definitions we can get carried away with memories, with dates, with uh, specific things about that, that um, particular compound and it can get rich and sometimes it can get comp too complex for other people other than yourself to understand. Um, your cultural bias, the things you've been experienced in life, how many things you tasted in life, and your personal taste, they can all play a huge role. And then back to language, the uh, unfairness of having a lot more inputs than outputs, that leads, that leads to a lot of complexity to formulating sentences. You see that I'm here sitting, talking to you guys, and, and trying to be uh, as clear as possible on the message uh, brought to you. Uh, we have so many inputs and, and so little outputs of communication. That's why problems that we have at work or problems that we have in our personal lives always comes down to communication, the things that you want to pass on. Um, it's always, it's because we have so many, so many inputs and, and so little outputs. That leads to language being one of the most important factors 
on sensory training, on establishing the language, make sure that everybody understands the chemical compound that we're talking about. If you're doing a selective, a selective uh, a sensory panel, right? What that means is, if you're being selected because you either cannot or can detect an off flavor, and I'll, I'll, I'll talk about uh, what I just said off flavor in a little bit. It's very important to understand what's in that flavor, and that goes to language and definition too. But if you're doing if you're doing a selective sensory panel, if you're being selected because you uh, are very susceptible to a certain chemical compound or a certain flavor compound, or if you're being excluded from that sensory panel because you're not um, sensor, you're not sensitive to that compound. Either way, you have to understand what makes up that compound and whether you are sensitive or not sensitive or if you're just standard, if you can just detect that, that flavor compound. Uh, and go back to what I said about uh, off flavor. Well, and I, I, I said this, this before and I'll say it again. Off flavor is has changed a lot. What's an up flavor is very dependent on your brewery, on what you perceive as an up flavor, and what your client base that you're building perceives as an up flavor. Uh, what was an up flavor? It's very easy to, to define a, a base of an up flavor when you have one mainstream beer that was the case in the 70s and the 60s, and then we're like mid 80s, late 80s, early 90s with the experience with the growth of, of the craft breweries and so many breweries uh, uh, in the world and so many import, import beers, beers from the different, different countries and um, as the world became much more globalized and, 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 con and, and interconnected to each other, it's, it's very important to note that what's an off flavor to me, it may not be an off flavor to you. So that's, that's very, 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 very dependent. Um, age and health, very, very, very important. With age, there's a lot of things that um, enhance, like the, the amount of things that have exposed your life, but you tend to, to lose a lot of the things. It's a, it's a tendency, it's not a fact. But you tend, uh, some things tend to get worn out. Your health depends on it. if you have a cold, if you have any, if you, if your um, your sense of your sense of smell is uh, debilitated, you will not be as efficient as someone who's healthy, right? Practice and memory of and knowledge of compounds. We're going to talk about a few a few compounds that I feel like everybody have to have in a back pocket on, on their back pocket when the subject is sensory training here and spe uh, specific to fermentation. And the subjectiveness and objectiveness of the uh, the subject, the concentration versus perception. Um, I said it before. I used uh, uh, I used the example of butyric acid, but um, the objectiveness of, of of sensory is the um, the amount of things, the amount of con the the concentration of that certain compound that is. Um, dissolved into the beer right that's that it's there whether you can pick up or not that's a subjectiveness and to to what extent you're going to be able to pick up on that that's that's objective right uh fatigue and adaptation we can we can become fatigue fatigued due to several uh, different samples. I uh, would not recommend more than six samples um, that will lead to fatigue and, and your senses are going to start to get debilitated. Okay. Any questions so far? Let me go back to the chat and see how we're doing. Okay, good to know. Good to know that we um, refreshing the screen helped you a little bit. Um, so 
So let's go ahead. I, I, I cover I cover quality control tool, and we can brush a little bit on it. We can talk a little bit about um, the quality control. What are you going to use this for? To define the, the, the flavor profile, to monitor unwanted flavor compounds. It's very important that you know and uh, uh, know what's to come, know what to, uh, what to expect. If it's very important that you have a good data of your process, because and it's tied up to the validation of the brewing process and ingredient changes. Now more than ever. Um, now more than ever in the, this time that we're living right now, we, we cannot rely. And before as well, um, that's something that we have to prepare. Any ingredient changes, any any uh, um, any shortage on ingredient that makes a huge, a, a big character, they consider a big character for your beer. It's very important that you monitor that 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 if you happen to have to replace it what's the best way to replace it what's the best way to replace a certain uh, a certain piece of your uh, of your recipe of what makes up the flavor of your beer what's the best way to replace as best as possible with cause and minimum impact if that's if that's what you call the whole point of being a brewer is to have control to have complete control of of your process and i tell the students all, all the time what's the difference between science Science and uh, playing around is to take notes and take notes all the time is not fun. Hence, it's, it becomes a job, um, but it has to be done because you have to have control. Otherwise, you're not going to get a consistent product and you're not. It's going to become very difficult for you to have your blaze clientele, your your. Um, Irregulars that, that that look for the same experience that they they, they 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 want to come back for a reason. So it's very important. It's very important. Product is very 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 important. Development of your product, um, and and I think I mentioned I think I mentioned last time too that uh, uh, you have to become every time that you add a new ingredient to your. Uh, to your knowledge of how to how to brew a beer, uh, every it's kind of like meeting a new person, uh, completely, uh, and you're gonna learn you're gonna learn about that ingredient, kind of the same way you get to know a new person. You know what to expect, um, and I feel like I feel like we're we're a little bit too quick to judge on the hop. Sector, I feel like it takes more than one or two brews to understand the the, the whole makeup of the uh, of the hop character, the hop. And I say that because I see a lot of volatility on 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 hop requests. Oh, I want this. I want the the next the next hop. The next hop has to be hot. And so, what happened to Amarillo, which was great five years ago, is still an amazing hop. And I got to know Amarillo. It took me it took me a few years to actually. To actually know what what it had to offer, you know, when you meet when you meet somebody for the first time, you okay, so that's it. That's a good person. I like her. I have a lot in common with her. And then you become friends with that person, and then you start to become more comfortable with that person. And then sometimes you you don't agree with that person what that person said, and uh, now you have a fight with that person, and then you make up with that person, and then and then you build that relationship a lot. A lot more. I think it's the same with with hops and or, or hops or, or early ingredients that you knew with that you knew with that you know do you don't know what to expect. I mentioned hops because we have a huge hop variety, and sometimes we're we're a little quick to uh, to judge, and uh, uh, sometimes we don't notice the, the small things. And and on, on long term, uh, for you to have control, you have you have to take time to get to know your ingredient um, and uh, what what happens in there, right? Exact methods of the da and data evaluation that that goes back to the science the uh, the taking taking notes correct the difference between science and, and playing around is taking notes so you you need to establish a an order on how you do things within the brewery and continuous training guys I cannot stress that enough uh, and that goes I'm gonna go back here to to language. And I said that I, um, 
I, I was talking about the uh, the difference uh, or, or the selective selective sensory. I didn't consider myself to be a super taster or someone that is uh, can taste everything everywhere. And you know, my wife tends to tell me that uh, oh, you have such a sophisticated palate, and I disagree with that statement. I think I'm just average. I think I I'm not blind to anything, but I'm not overly sensitive but it is detectable. And I think that's all due to training. I think that the only reason that I can detect everything across the board is due to training. Uh, I give the example of the German Shepherd. What's the difference between German Shepherd who's your pet and the German Shepherd who's sitting at home? Is uh, when, uh, oh, sorry, uh, German Shepherd who's, uh, who's uh, your pet and German Shepherd who's in the, um, in the airport, sniffing out for drugs, it's because one is trained, the other one is not. They're, they're made fairly the same, you know, despite minor changes on, on how we're built genetically, right? Okay, so with that, with that I covered, with that I covered a lot of the, uh, uh, a lot of the theory, right? That we talked about, the previous classes. Uh, I now would like to move on to some of the compounds developed during fermentation. So this is a fermentation focused uh, live session, and let's talk about a little about a little bit about the compound itself. I'm going to talk about four compounds that I picked out. The origins, the thresholds, and how to avoid it if that's not what you're looking for. So acetaldehyde. Acetaldehyde it's 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 very common. Um, the concentration we talk about parts per million. Um, it's on the degree of parts per million. It's fairly low on the parts per million. Started to be detectable when I talk threshold in beer. That's that's the threshold in average means the threshold in beer means that in the average the human being the human will be able to detect between ten and twenty parts per million. And in the textbook definitions precede that green apple and cut grass, acetaldehyde. Now, let me talk and that goes back to language. There is a lot of there there is a lot of uh, uh, um ways that you can define and uh, I do I tend to agree I tend to agree with with the uh, the textbook definition and a lot of the compounds acetaldehyde and, and green apple yes a little bit but not completely it's an overall greenness it's so overall greenness let's talk about the origin acetaldehyde throughout the glycolysis the glycolysis pathway when we get um, when we get uh, glucose, or, or in, in the case of beer, maltose, and it's broken down, and it's a very extensive uh, chain reaction, enzymatic reaction, chemical reaction, uh, throughout the glycolysis pathway, the very last precursor of, of the very last, the last precursor of the very last compound before it becomes ethyl alcohol, the precursor of ethyl alcohol is acetaldehyde and it's to me it's the general general uh, cellar smell it smells a lot like cellar um, but it's it's that green beer right it's uh, we, we beer from beer from the fermenter primarily uh, that's what it tastes like to me it's the best way that I can describe beer from the fermenter because we're also gonna get a high concentration of acetaldehyde in beer uh, beer from the fermenter, or, or, or unaged beer, or unmatured beer, or beer that has not been uh, uh, has not been finished fermenting. Now let's talk about when I do I I do a lot of uh, 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 this exercise. Does it does it smells? How does it smell? Can you pick up the difference between usually we have a control and we have on the, on the on another case of sensory training that. Uh, uh, that I talked about in previous lecture, we have a control, an unspiked beer, and we have our uh, our spiked sample with, uh, uh, in this case, with acetaldehyde. 
the first thing is that I ask is, does it taste, does it smell? Uh, um, can you detect the, the difference in smells between control? Say, so, yeah, okay. Does it taste like it smells? That's that's another big one. And, and for, in the case of acetaldehyde, um, the retronasal, after after you um, you have swallowed the sample, and what, what comes back, it's much more potent than the smell itself. You're going to see with a lot of those samples, with a lot of the spikes, with a lot of the, the flavor compounds uh, present in our uh, sensory kits, our kits meant to train you on how everything tastes like. It's completely the opposite. Uh, so I said all the high it is, uh, to me, it's, it tastes more, it smells more like apple in general than green apple by itself. And, and the cut grass, I can agree with that. But it's just, to me, it's very hard just to describe as as as, um, as just green apple. It comes with something else. Okay? Let's move on. Uh, any, if you guys, let's do the four compounds uh, that, were, that are present here in the presentation. And at the end of the presentation, I, I will open up for some uh, Q&A. Okay? So we can answer. So I'll, I'll read the chat after after we we've gone through the presentation. So diacetyl. Let's talk about diacetyl too. I talked about diacetyl in the essential one. I'm going to talk about it again because diacetyl is fairly common, but not as common as as people talk about. That's my that's my. I think diacetyl is one of the first one that one of the first ones that people. Kind of understand that it's present in the, in the wine world, it's present in the beer world, but it's just not common. As in my in my experience, I got to say my opinion, it's just not as common as 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 I think it is. And I think that there's a lot of people making a lot of confusion out there just because of they don't know how it tastes or how it smells. Uh, diacetyl is a ketone. Diacetyl is produced. By yeast, and it's also reabsorbed by yeast. Concentration is fairly low if you compare it to acetaldehyde, talking about 0.6 parts per million, uh, but it's perceived in the same in the same intensity. I would say, and actually, every every single despite what, what amazes me about our, our the way we are constructed as humans is that when you look at the object objectiveness. On, on, on the objective portion of sensory analysis, you're going to see a lot of different concentrations in parts per million, sometimes parts per trillion, but you're going to see that a lot of those compounds are perceived the same. Why are they perceived the same if they're in different concentrations? Why are we sensitive? Why are we, as humans, sensitive to uh, uh, certain compounds than, than others? There, there is probably an explanation for it. Um, but there's a lot to know about how we perceive certain compounds. There's a lot to understand on how we perceive compounds. Threshold in beer, you're going to see that it's fairly, fairly low. Um, and it's perceived as butter and butterscotch. Let's talk about the, the textbook definition. I never, never perceived as just butter. It's more it's more to butterscotch or, or a car caramel candy. Caramel. Butterscotch, forget, if you don't know what butterscotch is, if you never had uh, butterscotch, just it's Werther's, for example. The most the most popular way for me to tell you what uh, a butterscotch is, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a caramel candy. And the, yes, there's a lot, if you know how to make a, a, a caramel, if you ever make caramel at home, a caramel sauce or a caramel dessert of so soft caramels at home. I made it the other day. Um, I love caramel, by the way. I absolutely love caramel. But it's just, it's butter. Uh, uh, caramelized sugar and cream, basically. That's the foundation of caramel. And uh, uh, to me, diacetyl is, is re, it's much more, cl it's closer to butterscotch than, than just butter. Now, is that bad by itself? I tend to disagree. It's it's not. It's, uh, diacetyl is also the, the, the flavoring on, on popcorn, on, on microwave popcorn. It's that bad? No, uh, it's not bad. Does it belong in beer? That's that's the other thing. Um, no, not in higher concentrations. Uh, not to me, at least. And again, 
could be different to you. But remember when I said that diacetyl is not as common, a lot of wild yeasts and bacteria, especially Pediococcus, produces diacetyl. Uh, but it's more on ales. It's 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 yeast dependent. Some 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 strains are gonna are gonna produce more than others. Uh, but it's directly related to flocculation. So, and there is a historic reason. I just uh, we I think we're gonna we get we a little bit. We I can talk about if you guys ask me the uh, the historic reason on why British strains are more flocculent than others. I can tell you all about it. Uh, but but British strains tend tend to be more flocculent. So if you have a, a strain of yeast that's super flocculent, you you're gonna have the yeast producing the acetyl. The yeast in suspension will reabsorb or or convert that diacetyl once again, and then it's gonna precipitate. If you have a a, a, a yeast that's gonna flocculate too soon and, and precipitate down you will be left with a lot of diacetyl. Um, so improper maturations, microbial contamination, uh, yeast-related uh, uh, yeast strains, certain yeast strains produce more than others, that's going to make up diacetyl. But if you have a fresh, clean lager, and if you have a, a fully fermented uh, a fully fermented lager, a fully fermented ale, um, a, a very well attenuated beer, it's very unlikely, very unlikely that we will find diacetyl on that beer. A clean, attenuated beer, it's fairly unlikely that we will find diacetyl in there. So, just want to make sure you guys understand that and, and, and we can expand that more in the comments and have a, a, a bigger Q&A. Caprylic acid. Caprylic acid. It's it's a big one for me. I'm uh, I'm su actually I'm very successful with that because uh, uh, it's directly related to contamination once again and yeast breakdown. We yeast breakdown. Uh, uh, you know when in, if anybody here had uh, marmite and vegemite and or vegemite. That's all it is. It's autolyzed yeast. You now it's savory, uh, but it's just not pleasant in beer. It's you have to. It needs a higher a higher concentration for you to be able to detect it. But you can detect uh, as low as five to ten parts per million. So whenever whenever if you have large quantities of yeast cells breaking down during fermentation, or if you don't empty the cone, so if you think about a brewery. I'm sure that you guys here on this on this live event been to the breweries. I, I'm almost positive everybody here work uh, or worked in breweries before, but in the cone, you have the cylindrical conical vessels. Uh, there's a reason why you need to draw off the, the cone regularly of the fermentation. So fermentation is active. The What's keeping the fermentation active is the yeast and suspension. What's down the bottom are old cells and maybe even dead cells. Uh, um, and cells are not going to do anything for your, for your beer. On the contrary, it's going to bring in, to me, this is not flavor, caprylic acid. It is not flavor. It's perceived as soapy. To me, it, it tastes more fatty and candle wax. I can agree with that one, but it's that, that unpleasant. It's, it's fairly stale. It's, it can be soy like too uh goatee that's that's my special consideration too uh, uh, just goatee so it's not to me it's not desirable whatsoever one of my favorite here that i want to tie it up to uh, the last session is uh, uh the eugenol uh plus isoamylactate also perceived as bubble gummy i uh, the combination of eugenol and or four vinyl glycol it's it's um, um, bubble gummy, right? Uh, the combination of both. So I talked about it less uh, during the last session. If you guys want to uh, uh, check that out, you don't have to watch the, the, the entire video. I only talked about it at the at this this point in time, particularly at the end of it. You can skip skip until until I start talking about it. But uh, four vinyl glycol is, uh, the, its precursor is um, ferulic acid found in malt. 
uh, it's released in in lower temperature rests uh, from the malt, and then and then you need a yeast that has an extra gene that will produce an extra enzyme to convert the folic acid into 4 vinyl glycol. Eugenol is just an emulation of 4-VG. Isoamyl acetate, however, is an ester, and it's produced by yeast, it's produced by in more quantities by our uh, Tarula spore de Brookii, that's Tarula spore de genus de Brookii it's a species, and that, that that is known as the the half of Eisen yeast or the the German wheat beer yeast. I'm sure, many of you are, are familiar with with that strain and and how unique it can be, and it's specific to German wheats. To me, uh, that was the beer that got me into brewing. That 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 sparked that sparked the uh, uh, me to take my first step into into my career. I absolutely love uh, German wheat beers. I it, and I do have a very good memory of the first time I I ever drink one. I've ever drank one. You see the concentration, though. The concentration again. That's very, 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 very cool to look at. Uh, eugenol or four VG, one hundred and twenty parts per billion. And the concentration of ISO amyl acetate, 4.5 parts per million. So much, 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 much higher than uh, than than 4 VG. And you kind of perceive them the same. Sometimes I feel like I, I perceive more, depending on the beer. I perceive more uh, 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 4 VG, that clove-like character. I keep saying 4 VG, 4 VG, but the spice, it's the spice is that clove-like character, very clovey. It's actually Absolutely, exactly, a hundred percent like cloves to me. Um, top temperature and oxygen may affect, well, will definitely affect uh, uh, esters at the ester production. So the the higher the temperature, the more esters you tend to produce. Uh, oxygen, if you stress the yeast up a bit, if you lower if you lower your, your oxygen that the yeast utilizes to make up cell walls during fermentation, if you lower if you lower uh, oxygen, you will stress out the yeast, so you will produce more uh, uh, more esters as well. So it's 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 always so it's tend to be stress related. Okay, and here just to uh, just to iterate and to demonstrate, I like to paint the picture of of the concentration, right? We, we, we have to be technical as well. I talk about the human factor, which is, you know, it's sensory. We're talking about humans tasting beer. Uh, but look at the concentration. We can barely see the spicy compared to everything else. The high, the higher, as well, the higher it is, is, is the higher, uh, uh, um, concentration there. We have more of that, uh, of us that heights to perceive the same, but they all, to me, if we're sitting here, if we're doing the spikes, if we're adding those compounds and those exact same concentrations to the sample of beer, you're going to perceive, uh, or you should be able to perceive them as being equal. Okay, so that's that's the the what I love 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 to paint that picture to you guys. Okay, now I'm uh, basically done with uh, with the. the the presentation. I would love. I would love to open for Q and A. I see that you guys talked a little bit. Yeah, that's all. It is the butter on butter popcorn. To you, uh, I'm seeing here, Tad O'Neill. Um, it's more butter than butterscotch. Yeah, absolutely. So that's 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 how we um, that's how we make the same. Uh, that's that's. That's how you relate things and you interpret things in your brain. That's your 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 uh, uh, your output. That your output and, and and input. I'm reading here. Caprylic acid comes as aphthopy. Um. 
I mean, completely cancer can as soapy, uh, the same reason that hoppy beers will come off as soapy. Not necessarily, no. Uh, so the acrylic acid is more related to yeast breakdown. Sometimes some some beers uh, uh, comes off as soapy, and I think that's a hoppy beers. It's it's a hoppy character. It's a hop character. Uh, it can be related to viscosity. Uh, there are a lot of hot breeds uh, out there, and uh, I, in my days of, of brewing too, my days my days of brewing, I was. Always, I stuck with hops with a small selection hops that I trust and hops that I know what I'm going to get off of. And if I was going to implement a new hop, I I would take it very, very slow. What I would do, I would do a beer with uh, with uh, a single hop only to really to really understand what what, what the hops bringing. Um, so now I. This to answer the question, I think that hoppy is uh, um, the soapy that comes out of hoppy is more related to viscosity and, and, the, and the particular hop, the hop character. Okay. Please feel free to uh, ask questions. We're here for that. Next uh, next Thursday at this exact time, we're going to be talking about packaging, post production, post production of flavor compounds. What happens after your beer leaves the brewery? Uh, and that's very critical because you have to protect. You have to protect your beer even. When it can't be protected by you, you have to assure. So what we call we call that quality assurance. We have to make sure that you will be do everything you can to minimize how many things the beer is exposed to. I, don't know, I call it all out in the wild because basically you have no control. Of it. But so I see here. I noticed that using the SO5 tend to have more more autolysis. The SO5. Uh, S23. Those those are dry yeast, correct? I believe. Um, so the question is, um, I noticed that using SO5 tend to have more autolysis than S23 in the conical. Would it be good to drop the cone starting? Yes, absolutely. Fermentation. Actually, in the day, in the you brew, you knocked out. Let's say you did a morning brew, knocked out a beer in the middle of the day. Um, Middle of the day, the very next day, you, you start drop, you start, you start taking stuff off of your cone. And the very next day, within 24 hours, um, especially if it's a repitch, especially if you're, um, you repitch yeast, it's very important for you to drop out. And then, and then every other day, periodically, uh, then again, remember that what's going to keep your fermentation active, it's what's in suspension, what's in the bottom. Of the cone is not going to do nothing. It's going, it's going to enhance, or it's going to Enhance the risk of uh, uh, autolysis and of flavor related autolysis. What's in the yeast that creates the banana, the, the banana flavor and hepatitis? Some are more banana than clove to me. Absolutely. So it's it's more Ted. It's more about it's more about temperature. There are certain yeasts. There are a, a huge variety of uh, German wheat beers, but it's also related to stress. It's related to the brewer. Um, how he ferments the beer. Some brewers uh, like to ferment a little bit higher. I'm going to talk about Celsius here, uh, uh, 22 to 20, even 23 degrees Celsius, which there will be, uh, uh, so 68 is 20, so it will be 70 something, like mid 70s. Mid 70s will be, will be a little bit higher. The lower, the less stress uh, uh, and less esters produced. So it's more about, it's more about the the. It's it's there's a huge chunk of the banana flavor that it's related to production, how you ferment the beer versus, um, versus uh, uh, the yeast itself. Yeah, say fail. Okay. Onion like flavor, yes, Claudia. I'd like to talk about the onion like flavor. I think what I think you're referring to the onion like flavor is. Um, 
uh, uh, isovaleric acid. Isovaleric acid is the, what we get when we use old hops. It's also compared to on any cheesy uh, uh, old socks. I think that's what you're referring to, uh, uh, and something that I covered on the on the past couple of lectures. I think I think on on my the lecture of uh, June fifth, I talked about specifically the the use the utilization of degraded hops, old hops, oxidated hops will give you that that uh, uh, that ox the 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 oniony cheesy old hops uh, very stale too. So. Raw, raw ingredients, uh, raw material, completely related to hops, uh, more than more than fermentation. Does that make sense, you guys? What other questions you have for me? If we can keep going, another ten minutes, more than happy. Um, so the objective here is to keep this going, um, to be talking about other, other, uh, um, spikes, uh, if you guys have any requests, uh, if you have, if, if you want to understand more about how they're formed, if you want to do specific, uh, a whole lecture on on the makeup of certain certain flavor compounds, we can do that. This is an involve, involving uh, uh, a series, so. Okay. All right, guys. Thank you so much for Yep, that is Fala Marcos. Abraço. <laughs> Told you I was going to be putting that in the uh, on the laptop. Okay, we got a we got a couple more uh, questions popping up. No, we cannot. Uh, can can the yeast can the yeast reabsorb the autolysis flavor? No, we cannot. The longer the longer you leave the the dead yeast in there, the more you're gonna get. The more yeast is uh, 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 the more yeast is gonna die. If you don't wish to have those in your beer, you have to get rid of it. Acetaldehyde can be could be perceived as uh, as a white wine aroma. Absolutely, yeah. I actually I actually can can uh, I get that a lot. Especially Especially with the Sauvignon Blancs, I get that a lot. Yeah, maturation uh, uh, with with bad bacteria. That's another way. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much. Um, I'll catch you guys. I'll catch you guys in the next week, okay? Thank you guys for stopping by. Really, 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 really appreciate you guys' time. See you guys next week.